praised by critics as an historian who has the literary talents of a novelist, John Lucas is the author of more than 20 books, including The Hitler of History, in which he explores um, German Chancellor Adolf Hitler's life by examining more than 100 biographies that have been written about him. A recipient of the Ingersoll Prize, his other books include The Great Powers in Eastern Europe, History of the Cold War, Outgrowing Democracy, and Historical Interpretation of the U.S. in the 20th Century, The Duel, Hitler versus Churchill, the 10th of May to the 31st of August, 1940, and uh, one of my great favorites, Five Days in May, an account of the um, transformation of the attitude of the British cabinet in the face of the confrontation with Germany. His most recent books, Democracy and Populism, was published by Yale University Press, as is his new book, uh, June 1941, Hitler and Stalin, which will be published this month, and I just was fortunate to see an advanced copy of a few moments ago in my office. Professor Lucas served from 1947 to 1994 as professor of history at Chestnut Hill College and as its department chair from 1947 to 74. He's also had visiting appointments at many universities, including Columbia, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Budapest in his na native Hungary. Uh, I learned this morning, that, uh, this afternoon, that uh, on his arrival to the US uh, in 1946, though, one of his first engagements was uh, to come and give a, a talk at Yale at the, at the tender age of 23. So uh, we're delighted to have you here for this return visit. The title um, Professor Lucas has chosen for his lecture is Popular Tides and the Ship of State, and I'm pleased to introduce to you John Lucas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, since I'm honored to give this lecture, and as you believe me that this is not an empty phrase or an expression of false modesty, pray allow me to introduce myself by which I mean not my so-called achievements, but perhaps the main character of my thinking. And this is, is, this is that contrary to all dominant views of uh, versions of materialism and determinism, this is that the most important, indeed the most dominant, uh, the, the, the fundament, most important, indeed the fundamental basis of history, is what people think and what they believe. And then, and that the entire material organization of the world is the superstructure of that. Now, at the same time, uh, my anti-materialism is also contrary to that of most idealist philosophers, because it is my conviction also that ideas as such do not matter. What matters is why and when and how people choose them. We do not have ideas, ladies and gentlemen, we choose them. And today my discourse attempts to describe two examples of this condition in the history of the United States. More than 150 years ago, more than 170 years ago, our great master and seer Tocqueville saw and described something about which he drew a conclusion which is largely ignored by thinkers and historians and political theorists since. This was that the movement of ideas and what may be called public opinion in the democratic age and in a democratic society is not at all rapid, but often agonizingly slow. Now, at the time Tocqueville lived and wrote, 
those people who feared the coming of democracy had thought and believed the opposite. They believed that when masses of people come to power, the unavoidable result would be a feverish agitation of ideas, of going from one extreme to the other, uh, uh, shaking society apart with incalculable damages to safety and order. Tocqueville wrote that the very contrary was true. The very factor of public opinion, its manufacture, and its prevalence, the manufacture and the prevalence of public opinion would result in a fateful and often lamentable and sometimes even dangerous slowness amounting to lassitude, an obstacle to change when necessary. Now, he did not particularly relate this to foreign policy in the democratic age, about even though in another of his brilliant chapters he said that the conduct of foreign policy will be much more difficult in a democratic age than in aristocratic societies when minorities ruled. And now it is, now there are two examples in the foreign policy of the United States, or in other words, to the, to, to, to the determination of the course of the giant ship of state that I must turn, I will turn. The first example will focus on the 1930s, when the first symptoms of a coming Second World War began to accumulate. My second example will focus on the early mid-50s, when the first symptoms of a change in the nature of the Cold War was beginning to occur. Uh, the United States declared war on Germany in April 1917. There's reason to believe that the division in Congress uh, at the declaration rather accurately reflected the divisions of public opinion at the time. Uh, 363 congressmen voted for the war, 50 against. 90 senators voted for the war, 6 against. Very soon after this declaration of war, the emotional tide of hatred against Germany reached absurd peaks, which I need not illustrate at this point. Let me just tell you two things. From 1917 onwards for three years, the Metropolitan Opera struck Wagner from its repertoire. And in 1918, the judges of the Westminster Kennel Club decided to exclude Dax Hunds from the list of approved species. Yes. Now, two years later, this tide receded. Reaction and disappointment set in, not so much against the war, as against the results of the war, not so much against Germany, as against Europe at large. The Senate rejected President Wilson's favorite idea, American participation in the League of Nations. Thereafter, the majority of Americans rejected the Democrats and chose the Republican Party. President Harding won easily. He coined a new word, normalcy. This was a triumph of American isolationism, which is an overall term that is imprecise and the components of which were complicated. But a diagnosis or an analysis of this is not my main purpose now. What I wish to emphasize, what I wish to draw attention to, that the peak of the popular tide of isolation, isolationism occurred not in 1920, but 16 or 17 years later, in 1936 and 1937. Now, this reversal of the national enthusiasm for World War I in 1917 involved isolationism as well as the image of Germany. These two matters were not the same, but they overlapped nonetheless. Let me now trace very briefly, but I hope not superficially, the development, or call it the stages, of this huge tide of slowly rising 
American opinion and sentiment. It began what we may call historical revisionism. Contrary to the so-called scientific and the so-called object objectivist conception of historians, don't worry about that because history is revisionist. History consists history consists of the forever rethinking of positions and people of the past, which then may, this rethinking then may be the result of new evidences, but also of new perspectives. See, unlike law, the historian history deals with multiple jeopardy. Now, what happened beginning in 1921 was that American intellectuals, journalists, historians, with the help of the then newly opened and published German documents, began to question openly the wartime slogan of uh, the wartime slogan of the unique German war guilt. There were, by and large, some reasons for this kind of questioning. But it's significant that the propagators of this questioning were by and large men and people who had turned against the extreme manifestations of American militarism during the war, most of them whom we may designate liberals and radicals. Thus, for example, as early as 1920, the journal The Nation attacked French and not German militarism. A year later, an editorial in the same periodical wrote, who has contributed more to the myth of a guilty nation plotting the war against a peaceful Europe than the so-called historians who occupy distinguished chairs in our universities? Now, at that time, 1921, such opinions affected only a small segment of what may be called public opinion. They were current only among some historians and intellectuals. Yet in no country other than the United States were the successive waves of revisionism so influential in eventually molding public opinion and even national politics at large. Before the end of the 1920s, the revisionist cause became supported not only by many historians, but by celebrated literary figures such as Mencken or Albert Nock, and by the editors of some of the most prominent literary weeklies and monthly magazines. Then in 1930, around 1930, the revisionist wave was further swelled by the confluence of another historical argument, that about the origins of the war in 1914, not about the origins of the war in 1914, but about the American entry into the war in 1917. The time had come to revise not only the thesis of the German war guilt, but the story of American involvement of the war. By the early 1930s, article after article, book after book, attacked American intervention in the First World War. This new kind of retrospective American pacifism was no longer the main argument of isolationist Republicans. It was taken up by many Democrats as well. Gradually, simply, what were earlier the beliefs and arguments of a few intellectuals and historians, these arguments were trickling down to the, first to the political and then to the popular level. Its momentum was gaining ground. By 1930, the writings of the revisionists had a definite influence on important congressmen and senators, mostly Western populists, such as George Norris, Gerald F. Nye, William E. Bora, who had once opposed the First World War, but by 1934, the isolationist and revisionist and pacifist sentiments had merged. Their potential popularity was so large that a congressional committee presided by Senator Nye found it politic to raise a public spectacle, to investigate the doings 
the mischiefs of bankers and munition makers and other villainous promoters of the American entry into the war 17 years before. You may be interested to know that one of the counsels of the Nye Committee was Alger Hiss, a Quaker pacifist then, not yet a communist. In 1935, Congress passed the first Neutrality Act, a definite reaction against the memories of the First World War. In 1936 and 37, an amendment to the very Constitution of the United States was proposed in Congress by Congressman Ludlow, requiring that any American declaration of war must be preceded by a national referendum, and then and uh, depend upon the results of that. In 1937, the Neutrality Act was extended and made more stringent. By that year, the, this new version of World War I and the rejection of all wars had appeared in high school textbooks. A senator, Homer Bone of Washington, declared, a, a quote, a fact known even to school children in this country Everyone now knows to know has to come to recognize that the Great War was utter social insanity and we had no business in it at all. This was 1937. Now, I have now tried to illustrate a, signific a significant phenomenon to which, alas, few historians have devoted sufficient attention. This is the slowness of the momentum with which ideas move and then appear on the surface, or call it the time lag in the movement of ideas which then appear on the political surface at the wrong time. That alone gives the lie to Victor Hugo's famous saw about an idea whose time has come. Believe me, I'm not a cynic when I say that I think an idea whose time has come cannot be any good. You know, yeah, yeah. Or seldom any good. Now the high tide of revisionism, or call it isolationism, or call it American exceptionalism, came not in the early 20s, when there may have been cogent reasons to mitigate the mistreatment of Germany, it occurred in the mid-30s, when Germany was rising anew, and how? Here is one instructive example of what was happening. The most serious and still very valuable book about the history of American intervention in the First World War was written by a serious man by the name of Walter Millis. It's called his The Road to War, was published in 1935. It became a bestseller with 60,000 copies in print in 1936. But Millis, who was a serious and honest man, regretted this. He was appalled by the use some people were making of his book that, after all, dealt with the past and not with the then present. By 1938, Millis was for resistance, indeed intervention against Hitler and other dictators. He wrote an article, 1939 is not 1914. But I'm running ahead of my story where I must focus on 1936 and 37. And when the history, not only the history of books, but what had become the high tide of I shall spread now over the broad lowlands of popular sentiment. There are umpteen evidences for this. Public opinion research was begun by George Gallup in 1935. In 1937, he reported that 70% of Americans were opposed to any kind of American intervention in any European war. Yet this was the year, 1937, when Hitler and Mussolini and the Japanese were not only rising, but starting to move. In October 1937, President Roosevelt made a speech in Chicago that expressed his concerns with the world, a speech that in retrospect reflected his wish to change the course of the American ship of state. That was the so-called quarantine speech, in which this president, obliquely, 
not specifically, and in very general terms, said something about an American and international necessity to quarantine all aggressors. The reaction to this speech of Roosevelt's was divided in the papers. It was not overwhelmingly critical, but this president found it politic to think so. During the next two years, when Hitler was overrunning Europe, when Mussolini thought it best to ally with him, when the Japanese were overrunning the entire coast of China, Roosevelt's moves in foreign policy were undertaken mostly secretly, while his public statements were couched in generalities. He was convinced, even well into the Second World War, that many, if not most, of the American people were isolationist and must be talked to as such. A few, year, a few days before his third term election, in October 1940, in Boston, he said, I say to you again and again and again, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. That, of course, was not what Roosevelt thought and believed. But my theme today is not Roosevelt's character or his foreign policy. I am not even going to speculate whether an open, whether an open American declaration, let alone involvement in Europe or in China before 1940, would have really deterred Hitler or the Japanese Empire in their march forward. It may be enough to state that the height and the mass of the popular and populist tide in 1937 was a tremendous handicap or obstacle for any American leader who, scanning the horizons of the world, would have seen the need to change the course of the American ship of state. I now turn to the second example of my discourse that is similar but not identical with the earlier sketched example in our national history. As a matter of fact, it is only similar in the essential factor of the time lag or momentum. The American political and popular reaction against the Second World War II was similar but not identical with that against the first. It was more subdued, it was seldom outspoken, and its components differed from those of two or 20 years before. It was similar in that it led to a rise of the Republican Party and to the decline of the Democrats. The slogan of the Republicans in the 1946 congressional election in which they gained much was suggestive and implicit, had enough, Enough of liberalism, enough of New Deal, enough of alliances with the Soviet Union, communistic influence in the government, so forth and so forth. Two years later, President Truman was still able to eke out a narrow victory. But meanwhile, a change had occurred that in a way would dominate American politics for the next 40 years or even more. This was the rise of anti-communism that very soon threatened to become identical because in the minds of millions of Americans it was identical with American patriotism. But before sketching its phenomenal rise, let me draw attention to a revolution in popular sentiment from 1945 to 1947 because it may tell us something about the inadequate term of isolationism. What happened by 1947 was that most isolationists, who only a few years before were determined to oppose bitterly any kind of American intervention against Germany, now had become the most insistent proponents of American intervention against Russia. This again is not the place to analyze and diagnose the source of this conversion if indeed conversion it was, since the theme of my discourse is not that of the sources, but of the consequences of what was happening thereafter. The popular and political tide 
for, of anti-communism rose and rose, reaching unprecedented heights in 1954-55 and receding only slowly and partially thereafter. Of course, events in the world in the late 40s, the Soviet enforcement of totally subservient communist governments in Eastern Europe, the Berlin blockade, the Korean War, so forth and so forth, contributed to it. And it also brought about largely reasonable adjustments in the course of the American ship of state, such as President Truman's decision to stand by the Greeks and the Turks, the Marshall Plan, NATO, and the President's decision to enter the Korean War. But note that all of these decisions were made and undertaken before and in 1950. While the popular tide and obsession with communism rose and rose ever higher during the years thereafter. Again, this is not the place and the time to illustrate its absurd and dangerous peaks during the early 1950s. But one precise example coinciding with the huge rise and its peaking from 1950 to 1954, the highest point, is the story of the career of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who chose to select anti-communism for his main political weapon and instrument only in late 1950, and whose phenomenal rise of influence did not break until late in the summer of 1954, President Eisenhower himself uneasily and surreptitiously chose to arrange some forces against McCarthy, who then became entangled in his own rope, and what a coarse and rough rope that was. But now consider that only two years earlier, this same Eisenhower had found it politic to visit Wisconsin and endorse McCarthy, who had attacked General Marshall, the benefactor of Eisenhower, as a traitor. That the very undersecretary of war, Stevens, in 1954, quailed and crumbled before McCarthy when the latter attacked him in 1954, that the Democrats, too, were loath to say anything bad about anti-communism. Indeed, it was the liberal Hubert Humphrey who in 1954 proposed simply the outlawing, outlawing the already largely extinct Communist Party in the United States. But now, please pay attention to the then course of events. All of this enormous tide rose and rose to its peak at the very time when the Soviet Union had begun to retreat. In March 1952, Stalin himself proposed a retreat of the Soviets from East Germany in exchange for an American retreat from the occupation of West Germany. Uh, that proposal was rejected and ignored by the West, the United States, and West German governments, perhaps because it was too dangerous. But less than 12 months after later, Stalin himself died. There were many signs that the new rulers of the Soviet Union were in disarray. And then in 1954 and 55, they, they decided to retreat from their occupation of Eastern Austria. They agreed to an Austrian peace treaty. They removed their naval and military bases from Finland. They renounced their rights in Manchuria and gave up their naval and military bases in China. They reestablished their normal relationship with Yugoslavia. They gave diplomatic and state recognition to West Germany without demanding that West Germany and its allies recognize East Germany. In sum, the retreat of the Soviet Union from places in Eastern Europe, which was a veritable unilateral change in the course of the Cold War, occurred at the very same time when popular sentiment in the United States had risen to its very peaks in 
suffused or perhaps gorged by the popular belief that communism and democracy, East or West, were irreconcilable, that there was an unavoidable and protracted war between them going to the very end. I have not suggested, rather than drawn, a similarity between the lamentable nature of tides of popular sentiment around 1937 and those of less than two decades later. But there the parallel ends. In 1937 and thereafter, the presence of isolationist sentiments was an obstacle to a president and to others who wished to change the course of the American ship of state. In 1952 and thereafter, the then president and his secretary of state did not wish or even consider the necessity of changing the course of the ship of state. They were navigating in accord with popular sentiment and with a political calculation thereof. Um, I have a small quote from the diary of an important American in nine, on the, written on the two days after Stalin died. He said, uh, Stalin's successor have been appointed as was generally expected. This is a day which the Russian advisors have looked forward for years. Kennan and Bolan have been talking about the day when Stalin would die, but the boys in the State Department and filling the White House have no strategy. This could be a moment when it would be possible to pry open the door for peace somewhat, even with some segments of the Soviet Union, but as far as we know or can see, there are no such plans whatsoever. Well, um, and you see, now I wish to draw attention to three examples, what I consider missed opportunities after death of Stalin, of the then at least possible winding down of the summer of the Cold War, and of the ideological obtuseness that compromised the course of the American ship of state. The first illustration and it is an illustration of time lag, is that of two men, Winston Churchill and George Kennan. In different ways and in different circumstances, they had been concerned with Stalin's and the Soviet Union's ambitions much earlier than were others, even during the war. They had issued warnings about that uh, to the um, then American political and military establishment, but largely in vain. They were unheard and unlistened to for a long time. Then their voices were heard and approved in 1946 and 1947 with Churchill's Iron Sp Curtain speech and then Kennan's long telegram and containment proposition. But as early as 1950, and even more in 1952 and 53, in different ways and to different audiences, both Churchill and Kennan believed that the time had come to explore contacts with Russia for the sake of correcting the unnatural and the dangerous division of Europe. Their statements fell into a void. They were not listened to, they were dismissed, sometimes with contempt. The same Eisenhower, who in 1945 preferred to embrace Marshal Zhukov rather than agree with Winston Churchill, seven or eight years later, rudely dismissed Churchill, called him privately as senile. The same Kennan, whose rejection of communism was based on his own sterling principles, had been based on his own sterling principles years before the Cold War, was dismissed by John Foster Dulles in 1953 and quit his long earned position in the American Foreign Service. In one sense, both of them were like Edmund Burke, about whom Charles James Fox once said, Burke is a wise man but he's a wise man too soon. In other sense, we may say that both Church and Kennan were not proponents of ideology, but men and statesmen of principle. 
Uh, this brings me to another argument, which I confess is a historical argument rather than an illustration. This is what, to my mind, is an inevitable and overdue glance at the entire historical landscape of the 20th century. That century was a short century, lasting 75 years, from 1914 to 1989. Its landscape was dominated for America and America and Russia alike by the two enormous mountain ranges of the two world wars in the shadows of which we were living surely till 1989. The second world war was largely the consequence of the first world war and the subsequent cold war was largely the consequence of the second world war. This is so obvious, at least for me, that it's hardly worth restating or repeating. But now consider how this perspective is entirely contrary to a both popular and political perspective, indeed belief, that has governed American politics and the course of the American ship of state for at least 40 years, from the mid-40s to the late 80s, from the end of the Second World War to the end of the Cold War. This is the view that not only the history of the United States, but that the entire history of the world in the 20th century was governed by the struggle between communism and democracy, or call it communism and capitalism, or call it totalitarianism against freedom, whatever you will. William Buckley and James Burnham, the founders of American conservatism, so-called conservatism, in 1955, put it in this way. Like, in 1917, history changed gears. Whatever that hobbling metaphor may mean, you know, this is complete nonsense, you know. Uh, the tragedy, the catastrophe of Europe in the 20th century was 1914, the outbreak of the war, not 1917. It also reduces, among other things, the Second World War to an odd and unnatural episode. Yet nonsense or not, this perspective and belief was popular enough to be adopted not only by Eisenhower and Dulles, but continuing to be the mainstream of the popular tide that true began to recede after, recede after 1954, but only somewhat, indeed remaining powerful enough decades later when it helped to propel Ronald Reagan into the presidency, who then declared the Soviet Union to be the evil empire. I do not wish to be misunderstood. I did not in the 1950s, and I do not now consider the Soviet Union as having become a thoroughly reformed or peaceful power in the world. I do think that there was a chance not to eliminate, but to reduce the Cold War and to attempt a correction of the division of Europe with the new Soviet leaders in the 1950s, a possibility, though not a certainty. At the same time, indeed in the same breadth, I must close this, the main portion of my lecture, by an illustration of how much short-sightedness or harm the overwhelming adoption of a popular ideology can do to the course of the ship of state. Now notice this, in 1956, after Nikita Khrushchev himself had accused Stalin publicly and corrected Stalinism to the leading people of the Soviet Union itself, a few months later, Section 9 of the Republican Party platform before the 1956 election called, I quote, for the establishment of American naval and air bases all around the world, unquote. And this was the political party, still called isolationist by some of its short-sighted liberal critics. All around the world. You may now well ask me, what is the lesson of all this? <laughs> 
Or how is all of this relevant to American foreign policy at present? My answer is that it's not relevant at all. <laughs> yeah, no. We live in a different world, and not only because the dangers of a German Third Reich or of an aggressive Soviet Union are gone. And the question that I wish to raise at the end of my discourse involves not the course of the ship of state, but the very character of the function of its government. Or in other words, not so much the direction of events, but their very structure. Not what happens, but what makes things happen. Fifty years after the founding, after the elections, fifty years after the founding of the republic, and the, and the dying out of the founders, in the age of Jackson, elections and politics in the United States became contests in popularity. That has been remarked by many historians. But they, by and large, have failed to remark that there has been another devolution, not in the 19th, but in the 20th century, leading no longer to contests in popularity, but of contests in publicity. Now, what does this have to do with the subjects of my discourse? Not very much, except that we may see here to a devolution. We have seen that in 1937, the great majority of American popular sentiment was, was, what, was what was then and what may still be called rather inaccurately isolationist. Yet I have also said that the reaction of public opinion to Roosevelt's quarantine speech was divided. This means that the upper classes the, it means that at that time public opinion, the opinion of educated Americans, of the middle and upper classes, or the readers of the better city newspapers, was by and large less isolationist than was again by and large popular sentiment. However, 15 years later, in 1952, such a distinction no longer exists. The foreign policy, indeed the ideology of the Eisenhower administration, chose to be imperfect, to be in perfect or near perfect accord with what was at that time popular sentiment. There were of course times, as during the Vietnam War, when sentiments and opinions among the American people were divided, though less than what appeared then on the surface. But now, well after the 20th century, it makes no longer sense to distinguish between public opinion and popular sentiment when it comes to American politics, including that of foreign policy. All of this is but part and parcel of a much larger and deeper process, which is the devolution of democracy into populism. So far as the Republican Party goes, its once opposition to populism has devolved to a stage where it has not only embraced populism, but where it is the principal populist and nationalist party in the United States. So far as the Democratic Party goes, it is both compromised and marked by the fear that it might not sound nationalist or popular enough. All of this may yet change. So let me conclude my discourse with one somber and one hopeful conclusion. So far as the course of the American ship of state goes, let me cite the profound words of the German physicist Werner Heisenberg about the, let me say, utterly questionable idea of progress in general. He wrote more than 50 years ago, in 1955, there is the belief that the expansion of material and intellectual powers of mankind is always progress. This has its, at first, not always visible limits. Perhaps one can illustrate this with a simile. 
with a seemingly limitless extension of its material powers, mankind seems to be in the situation of a captain whose great ship is so strongly built of steel and iron that his magnetic compass indicates the ferrous mass of the vessel, but not the position of the magnetic north. Such a ship cannot reach its goal. It will sail around in circles and eventually become a subject of the winds and the tides. The danger exists, this danger exists as long as the captain fails to realize that his compass no longer reacts to the magnetic forces of the earth. I dare to think that mutatis mutandis, this simile may apply to the recent foreign policy of the United States or to the main course of the American ship of state. But I shall not conclude my discourse on a note of black pessimism. Let me, let now and my audience listen to three kinds of encouragement from three very various sources, perhaps in descending order of their importance. One is my belief, no, my conviction, and my experience, my belief in providence that history is and remains unpredictable. The other is the maxim of the great French moralist La Rochefoucauld to the effect that things are never as bad or as good as they seem. You know. And the last is a statement of Edmund Burke, to whom I referred earlier, who said more than 200 years ago, the people, sir, must never be regarded as incurable. Thank you. Yeah. an interesting lecture. I think one of the, the marks of its interest is the way in which you, you probably have anticipated and responded to many of the questions that people were um, uh, writing on the backs of their, of their notes while you were speaking. But um, I'm hoping you will agree nonetheless to entertain some questions. Um, uh, great. Um, but before we start that, let me just say, at the conclusion of, of this lecture, there will be a reception up on the second floor to which everybody is invited. Um, okay, the floor is open. What was the last uh, phrase that you said about that Edmund Burke? This is the people, people sir must never be regarded as incurable. Yes. Yes, sir. A number of times you said, thing, uh, th uh, said things which I agreed with and which reminded me of something that Robert King Burton, the sociologist, said. What people believe, whether right or wrong, has consequences. And that happens all the time. Oh, yes. Oh, that's the only thing that matters in the world, what people think and what they believe. Now, the Marxist think that think the idea so what people think and believe, art, intellect, is the superstructure, that the basis of history of the world is the material organization of it. That's what some capitalists believe, too. Both of them are utterly wrong. It's just about the other way around. A little louder, would you mind? In the light of history and your perspective, how would you view the Eisenhower years with the Cold War and the, uh, the standoff and his, his administration of the United States? How would you view that administration and perspective? Well, it's a very large question. I was a little tough on Eisenhower in this uh, uh, lecture. I'm usually not quite as tough on him, but. Uh, I, I uh, 
I have written about this here and there, I take exception to the view that all the troubles, you know, you know, youth revolution, sexual revolution, and so forth, and they were troubles, you know, started in the 1960s, and compared to them, the Eisenhower years were benevolent and wonderful years of peace and prosperity and moderation. This is not so. I could give you many examples. The only exa the example I gave here it was in foreign policy. Again, I must tell you, it was not ruinous. It didn't lead us into war. So, but, but you see, a revolution began in the 1950s. This is a, you see, it was in the 1950s that the fatal decline of the appeal of liberal opinions and beliefs began, which is yet sinking, sinking, sinking. Let me give you an example. In 1950, you know, you got me on something that, uh, you know, rouse. In 1950, Lionel Trilling, you know, who was not a fool, he said, there's no other idea in American intellectual life but the liberal idea. In 1954, a historian, Louis Hart, wrote a book published by Harp that the American political idea is the liberal idea. Uh, it was in the same year that Bill Buckley started his National Review on a shoestring. Thirty years later, the circulation of the National Review is larger than of the nation and the New Republic together. Thirty years later, more Americans regard themselves conservatives than liberals. I also want to tell you that the two American cities where, the con where, where most people regard themselves as conservative are Houston and Dallas, which is also, which are also two cities where you have the largest percentage of divorces. I mean, so, so far as, uh, you see, in 1950, there was not a single American political figure who would dare to say, I'm a conservative. Senator Robert Taft, who was a right wing of the Republican Party, said, I'm an old-fashioned liberal. McCarthy never used the word conservative. By 1960, President Eisenhower, who knew how to trim his sails, said, you know, in many ways, I'm a conservative. This, what, this is a revolution. This is a landslide in American history, you know, which still has not been adequately analyzed, discussed, described by historians. Uh, a little louder, please. Why do you think there's so little discussion, if any at all, of what the United States did in Iran in 1952? Oh, well, you see, this, the what, uh, actually, line 53, uh, uh, that, that, uh, the significance of this is only considerable in retrospect. In retrospect, because you know, Persia, Iran, the Middle East, and so forth, you know, this was a, at that time, a rather exceptional event, and uh, um, I would go so far that I would not criticize the American underhanded intervention in Persia. I'm very old fashioned, I prefer the word Persia to Iran, you know, in 1953. Um, I would, you know, I, I, I think this by and large was probably the right thing to do, and it, in the long run, it did not change uh, American relations to the Middle East. Perhaps there is, again, I don't know, perhaps there uh, might be more grounds to criticism about the American intervention in Guatemala in 1954. But these were very petty things. You see, what I'm concerned with is the American reaction to the Soviet Union division of Europe, where, as I said, some adjustments probably could have been undertaken. Yes. I wanted you to speak to the... A little louder, please. Sorry. 
Well, if you look at the very long run, you know, in a way what happened to the so-called American conservatives, you know, you know, Bill Buckley, you know, who is really, I know him very well, he's a very charming man, and, you know, he starts on a shoestring. And gradually, you see, uh, uh, conservatism of one kind or another. You see, I'm so... Uh, well, I don't want to talk myself. I no longer consider myself conservative. I am just a reactionary, you see. But, uh, yeah. but you see, this is, an, this is what happened, again, because of a vacuum, because of the general, often warranted, and perhaps sometimes not unwarranted, disillusionment with liberalism, and with some extreme applications of liberal ideas. See, there again is a time like, look, look, uh, uh, Buckley and the Concerto is 1955. In 1964, Goldwater, the first candidate who calls himself conservative, is still creamed in the elections. By 1980, Ronald Reagan uh, wins the election in a near landslide. Yes. Uh, yes. Germany in the next couple of days declared war against the U.S. Yes. Which I think allowed the U.S. to declare war against Germany as well as Japan. Yes. Do you think that in the absence of a German declaration of war against the U.S., public opinion in the United States has shifted sufficiently to have allowed for uh, going to war against Germany? Yes, I hear that question over and over again, and it's a very intelligent question. But you must understand the situation was quite different. We had a conference about this uh, 12 years ago in a university. You know, I, I, part, I was only one of the participants, and almost everybody agreed this is a wrong time. Yeah, this, this is, I mean, the war between the United States and Germany in December 1940 was, was inevitable. The United States was already engaged in a virtual naval war with Germany in the Atlantic. So the very fact that Germany declared the declaration, or rather the pronouncement of war, came from Berlin and not Washington, given the atmosphere and the conditions of the time, was almost irrelevant. You mentioned the uh, slide on the democracy to populism. Yes. Well, that's such an enormous topic, you know. I mean, of course, you know, democracy to some extent has to be populist in many ways. But you see, populism is an emphasis, uh, populism is a almost unilateral emphasis on majority sentiment, majority opinion, majority preferences, where the rights of minorities and the rights of opposition are underemphasized and not even and sometimes even uh, uh, not properly upheld and observed. But this is a complicated thing, you know. This 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 goes. There's something beneath this that is more important than the emphasis of majorities as against the right of minorities. This is what I uh, mentioned only in passing, the tremendous influence of publicity. You see, through publicity, popularity can be manufactured, constructed, sometimes even falsely established, repeated and repeated. You see, by repeating and repeating and repeating that something is popular, at least temporarily, it becomes popular. And this is, this is where, you know, the, our elections are no longer merely popularity contests. They are publicity contests. Publicity can be, and, and you see, this has very interesting consequences. One consequence of this is that it's not really majoritarianism because we have now, 
no, the whole world has always had, but we perhaps especially have now a phenomenon that cannot be expressed statistically. We have hard minorities and soft majorities. You see, a hard minority, at least for a while, can have an influence which goes way beyond its actual power and numbers. This will not last forever. As I told you, people must not be regarded as incurable. You know, but it can happen. One last question. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't really deal with this, not just because of kind of modesty or care, but all I do is read the newspaper, one newspaper, and even that newspaper I read with less and less enthusiasm, the New York Times, things getting worse and worse. But so, uh, so I, can, I can only tell you that uh, in a way, of course, you, know, the, you see, the mistakes made in this war are now so great that it proves Burke that people cannot be regarded as incurable. But you must understand that three years, three years ago, this war was immensely popular, you know, for no matter what reasons. People were not interested whether the, whether the Iraqis have uh, weapons of mass destruction or not. This war was very popular, mm -hmm. and our politicians you know, believe that. This is no longer so. But again, you see, if uh, um, I, I am convinced that if in, 19, oh, in, in 2003 or 2002, uh, the president's advisors would have thought that this war will be very unpopular, they would not have changed this course. They, might, they probably would have rightly been involved in Afghanistan, but probably not in Iraq. But this is nothing else but a hypothesis on my part. Well, I want to uh, ask everyone to join me in thanking you for uh, coming and speaking to us today. And I really appreciated it, and I know others have as well. Thank you.